episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, SDS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And tonight, a slightly different show, uh, obviously a really serious uh, subject matter that we're talking about. We're going to be talking about deadly divorces, but uh, we have three fun people, so uh, we're going to have fun while we're doing it. Um, Dan Markell. He had finalized his divorce from Wendy Adelson back in 2013, uh, but they were still in a dispute over personal property, finances, and also allegations from Dan that his former mother-in-law, Donna Adelson, who is sitting in the Leon County Jail right now, very unhappy and wanting to get out. Uh, he claimed that she was disparaging him during her visits with Ben and Lincoln, who are, of course, Dan's children and Donna Adelson's grandchildren. Uh, we know, as they say, the rest of the story, Dan Markell was murdered uh, July uh, 18th. He was shot. He died the next day, July 19th, 2014. Tonight, we examine why some divorces, not a lot, but by why, but why some get so heated that they end up in murder. Best guest tonight, just met the three of these people through Meve Moen, otherwise known as Steve Cohen. Shout out to Steve Cohen. The guy knows absolutely everyone. That is why you get the best guests in all of true crime. We've got the hosts on the bottom here. Worked out well. The host of the podcast called Divorce Etc. If you haven't listened, you better listen. Hope you don't need it, but to Divorce Etc. TH and Jess, they're best friends who live parallel lives. They were engaged a month apart. Married a month apart, and after 13 years, they found out their husbands were cheating and traveling with their girlfriends. No bueno. So they launched Divorce, etc. We'll have them explain a little more about how that all came about. And then on the top right-hand corner, coming to us from the Pacific Northwest, where we've got some STS Nation members, we've got Olivia Brooke Summerhill. Uh, she has been divorced as well. So she says there's a really good chance that she knows what you're going through if you're going through that. And she knows how complicated and overwhelming finances can be. So she actually started a firm to help divorcees get control of their money situations and help people like that who are going through this understand uh, their wealth, their goals and their values moving forward. So these truly are uh, the best experts when it comes to this topic. Uh, quick reminder, please. Support us on Patreon if you can. Support us on YouTube if you can. If you can't do either, please don't give us one-star hate mails, especially against my mother. That happened last week from Panda Fett, who I'm calling out. But please give us five stars. Audio helps us tremendously. If you're in the car and you can, please listen to us uh, on audio uh, platforms like Spotify, Apple, Audible, etc., Another reminder, December 20th, there is a live event with Ruth Markell. Uh, there will also be Dennis Murphy from Dateline, Dave Ehrenberg, the Florida State Attorney. That is December 20th. I'll put it up on social, uh, at Podcast STS on Twitter, at Surviving the Survivor on Instagram. And you can't forget this. Monday, Donna Adelson has her arraignment. We're going to take that live. We're going to have live coverage and analysis. I'll be posting that on Twitter as well, at Podcast STS. On Instagram at Surviving the Survivor. And then Tuesday, Charlie Adelson's sentencing happens. We'll take that live. And each night, a special show. And then Wednesday, we're working on something special as well related to the Justice for Dan Markell uh, community. There's one other story that I kind of wanted to touch on. I know I'm talking a lot. And I'm going to shut up in a minute. Jared Bridegan and Shanna Gardner. They're another couple uh, right across the way from where Dan Markell was murdered in Jacksonville, Florida, in North Florida. This happened February 16, 2022. Jared Bridegan, who is a Microsoft executive, sort of just like Dan, he drops off his nine-year-old twin son and daughter, Abby and Liam. There's something in the way on the road. He gets out to move this tire. He gets shot. Uh, since then, the ex-wife, Shanna Gardner, has been arrested. A hitman, just like in the Dan Markell, Charlie Adelson case, that hitman pleaded guilty, and um, his name is Henry Tennant, and then 
Shanna Gardner's new husband at the time, also uh, incarcerated right now, awaiting a murder trial. So two eerily similar stories. Without further ado, Jessica and I went to the same school, Brandeis University, which <laughs> you're the same year. No, you're not the same year as Wendy's much younger. Okay. Um, no offense. Sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> None taken. <laughs> yes. Tell me a little more clearly, how did you and TH, and I'll have TH uh, jump in as well. How did you start this? Um, you also have X experts and divorce, et cetera. Tell me about it. Right. X experts is our, is our website and kind of like the umbrella over everything with regards to um, our platform, which really is in, the mission is to empower and support people going through divorce with resources that they can trust because we've fully vetted them. Divorce, et cetera, is our podcast. We release an episode each week. We cover literally everything with regards to anything related to divorce, whether it's financial, custody, legal issues, what to do with your stuff, how to move forward and dating and just literally everything. Um, and it came about because we met in college because TH actually was best high school friends with my ex-husband mm -hmm. um when we all graduated oh i gotta stop you right there is th still friends with the ex no really. okay we say we got a question i got each other the divorce what, so, hold yeah. on what th what was that only because jessica speaks to him oh okay. i'm not friends with her with him anymore no okay i i'm nosy yeah. but i had to ask i'm a i'm a mature we are, we can ask us anything yeah you don't yeah. even really have to Okay. Um, well, we got, we went through life together. Like you, you mentioned engaged at the same time, married at the same time, and then found out within a week of each other that our husbands who were also best friends were having affairs and covering for each other. Mm -hmm. So we got divorced at the exact same time. And we were young in our like early to mid thirties, super small kids. And we were literally going through it step by step at the same time. And we acknowledged back then to each other, like how lucky are we? that we have each other to lean on and to like bounce things off of because we wouldn't know what we were doing. And we were like, one day we need to figure out a way to pay it forward to anyone going through divorce. It's scary. It's dark. It's frightening. Like you feel like the world is ending, but now 15 years out, we're all about looking forward and there is a silver lining. We believe that there's life after divorce. We're living proof. Um, and that's really what, you know, what we promote with ex experts and everything we do with the ex experts and divorce, et cetera, community. Well, Jessica, you've got a glow. You're looking very positive, very optimistic. Um, I should, I'm uh, happily married. I should be glowing, but um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's just as nice on the other side. You have no idea. Um, Bucks over here. I've been divorced oh God, six, six times. times. Um, Th to you. Oh. Um, after a certain number, should you just say, "Hey, I'm just going to date this person"? Um, is it after six? What What is that magic number, Th? I think six is scary. I think that's a lot of alimony, potentially a lot of child support if you have children six times over with everybody. So I'm not, I need a little bit more information, but six is definitely a red flag. Look at this comment from Jennifer Subay. This is a super sticker. I tell you, this is going to be a little bit of a wacky show. Number one, it's You're the end good. of a long week. Number two, I've got three fun people on. Number, I don't know what number I'm on. Jennifer Subay, want to hear something crazy? My husband and I got divorced after seven years and got back together and are so happy now. Um, Congratulations. That's crazy. Yeah, that's great. We hear those stories because yep. people work on it. They work on themselves. They work on, you know, the relationship. You have mm -hmm. to both be in it to want to make it work. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Yeah, there yeah. you go. So Olivia Brooke Summerhill. Mm -hmm. Do I have to call you Olivia Brooks Summerhill? Can I just call no. you Olivia? Okay, you just can Olivia. Call me Olivia. <laughs> okay, Olivia. Um, because it sounds so formal. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, Olivia Brooks Summerhill. I haven't watched any of these, but it reminds me of like Downton Abbey, which I thought was Downtown <laughs> Abbey for the longest I time. Did too. I did yeah. You're not the only one. Yes, and, and then I realized it's Downton. But anyway, uh, Olivia, tell us about your firm. It's called the Summerhill mm -hmm. Firm. Mm -hmm. What do you do there? So I help people who are terrified of the finances within divorce, specifically women who most of the time are the stay at home moms who have never touched the finances, who have the young children running around the house. And that's their main mission and goal is not to realize that the husband is having the affairs and spending money on them, but they need someone in their court during divorce. That's not going to fuel the fire like an attorney might. Um, we utilize attorneys when necessary but I really help alleviate the emotions of divorce and help you understand the finances. 
So during divorce only is what I what I do. We're getting some uh, interesting. I'm learning more about STS Nation. I always say best guest, be, uh, better community. Lauren McKenzie, I know someone who's on her fifth husband. Um, I don't is that know. That J Lo. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that. By the way, um, another shameless plug. But I have a book coming out about my mother called Surviving the Survivor. The same title. It's going to be uh, ready for pre order at the end of January. But in that very book, J Lo comes up, and my mom has mm -hmm. stuff to say about J Lo. And I put it in there. Um, I don't know if JLo is going to be too happy, but Carm pulls no punches. And she had an opinion about her marriage, about being part of Benefer again. She's got her opinion. It's in the book. Mm -hmm. So there's a good tease for you. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I have I have more questions before we dig into Dan Markell and uh, Wendy Adelson and also the Bridegan story. So Jessica and TH, you guys were best friends. Now, we're, you probably said this already, but I'm a, 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 a not, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I guess a poor listener, but were your two husbands, were they also close friends? Yes. Okay. So yeah. you guys were like a tight knit circle. Right. And, Traveled and our, together, did stuff all the time on the weekends together. Our kids grew up together, like four best friends. We were best friends. They were best friends. And are the ex-husbands still friends with each other? No. No. Is that over a woman? No. Well, no. not kind of. <laughs> it's not over a woman in the sense that they were going after the same woman. But I think that at a certain point, their women maybe weren't really getting along and just dealing with going through divorce and everything like shit just started not flying. And so I think that they drifted apart. And are they are the ex-husbands? Are they remarried? Mine is, and he has a seven-year-old with mm. the woman. See, you missed a little piece of it. So when, so Jessica and I found out at the exact same time because his fiance called me to see if I was still married to him, which of course I was. Wow. So yeah, but his so, obviously his his then girlfriend who's now no no his, no 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 you no. heard that right I did yeah, hear he right it was a fiance fiance. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. this is a whole different yeah. show than I was this expecting. This is a whole other episode. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, you I was can't make this shit happy. Up. Yeah. Ironically, that was the best day in my life because I was out of my marriage. He was the bad guy. Are you making sure he's not listening? Is that what I'm <laughs> <laughs> No, I feel like sorry. My son was just, just on speak. Were you just on speak? Were you just on speak? Oh, okay. Um, uh, anyway. Jessica, I'll have you pick that up. So they were yeah. so they were they so, so her ex is is married and has a kid with the woman that he subsequently married, but that who he was in fact engaged to while TH was still married to him. Mine stayed with the woman he had the affair with. They went on uh, in future years to have two children together. But then as things happen, he cheated on her with somebody else. They both got pregnant at the same time. You know. You might want to do a show. And so, on our whole right. Story. And so my ex never remarried, but has three additional children in addition to my two children. So he has five kids with three different women. Wow. A nice um, Brandeis boy. Wow. We're going to have to discuss some of this. Off <laughs> yes. We're going to have to really discuss this. So this reminds me, and I know we're way off the rails already. Consider that every Friday we do a show with America's most respected detective, Phil Waters, who's recovering from knee surgery. Shout out to Phil and Scott Duffy. And we go off the rails. But tonight I feel and not in a bad way. We're going off the rails. But um, I worked for a time as a business reporter on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And those traders that are trading that money on that floor, of that New York Stock Exchange, the stories that I would hear. There was <laughs> one. I'm just going to use a first name. His name was Glenn. Glenn, I hope you're not listening to this. The things that Glenn would do married with kids at home. First of all, this was when I, I was young. I was in my 20s and I did not get married till I was 42 years old. 40, I got engaged, I think, at 41, married at 41 or 42. So I did it much later. I never could have done it earlier. I wasn't ready mentally. I, I still say I got married too young. My mom yells at me. But <laughs> the point of this, this guy, Glenn, was my age, married in his 20s, and they the things that they would just do at lunchtime, the stories that I would hear were unbelievable. And these were guys that were like clean cut, smart, you know, but 
making a lot of money, doing it very young and doing crazy things. Let's um let's try to get on topic a little bit. Olivia's like, what the hell did I get into? Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel like I'm left out with my support. I just, <laughs> I, I, I just want to segue so. for you. Like, despite all the crap that TH yeah. and I have been for been through, we did not kill our ex-husbands. Let's just <laughs> start there. That's um that's a bonus. Well, a lot of times uh, my family is slightly well, my mom and I, our relationship's a little dysfunctional. So she likes to say sometimes we're almost like the Adelsons minus the murder. Thank God. Um, Adam Lamparello, he's a friend of the show. He's always on here. Super sticker here. Can Donna plausibly argue that she didn't know about the plot until after the murder, thus making her innocent of complicity? By the way, Adam's an attorney, uh, innocent of complicity and solicitation. This is a little out of the realm of divorce, but I think any I'm going to answer this because I just uh, was speaking to an attorney and I think any of these arguments, uh, Adam, are plausible and they're going to look for the best argument. The, the question here is, are they going to be pigeonholed into the same defense that Charlie had? I don't think that's necessarily the case, but uh, we're going to see how this uh, all plays out. Thank God someone is saying this. I love this panel. Great fun, ladies. Yes, they are fun, even though we are off topic. So let me get us on track a little bit, and then we'll kind of go around the horn. So things really went bad, and we're going to focus mainly on Dan Markell and Wendy Adelson here, and we'll do some of the bride and stuff. And you guys feel free. I'd, they sent us questions. It was kind of last minute. Tonight, by the way, happy Hanukkah, first night of Hanukkah. My kid got a Transformer costume, so he's – dressed up as a transformer <laughs> moving around and uh he's going crazy because his left foot keeps slipping out of the costume and he's got ocd i guess so um which doesn't the apple doesn't fall far from the tree anyway total insanity tonight dan comes home from a business trip he's living in tallahassee with wendy adelson who again went to the same college as, as jessica and i so it's a small world he comes home and uh, he finds out that basically everything in the house is missing. This all starts, by the way, uh, the wedding um, at Congreg Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton. Um, Wendy Adelson's a promising law student from Coral Springs, which is down here near Miami. He's this brilliant guy who went to Harvard undergrad, Harvard Law, and they've got the New York Times announcement. Before we go any further, I mean, TH, talk about... New York Times wedding announcements, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, you know, in the New York circles, it is, you know, it's the creme de la creme. Everyone wants to be in the New York Times to show their friends how well they, they you know, how happily married they are, how great their careers are, you know, what kind of track they're on. Correct. Am I right about that? Didn't you have one, B? I did have one. It was really <laughs> small. Only really important connected people got their picture up. I think I got like two lines of where I was married and on what date. Um, but you had to fight to get into that section. And then if you were, you got like 30 copies of the newspaper, of the section so you can hold it. I, I have no idea of where that is. That may have gone out with my with many of my photos. I'm not yeah. sure. By the way, I'm much more fixated on the obituaries. My whole thing is I want a New York Times obituary because <laughs> that means that you have accomplished something in life. But Carm always tells me I can't read it because I'll be dead. We discussed that in the book as well. I um, thought you were going to say you read the obituary so you can find a good apartment. No, but that's actually that's a Harry well, Met Sally thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's actually not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> you can meet, I don't know, people that are older and lonely, I guess. I don't know. Um, Olivia, mm -hmm. getting this back on track. Um, so... Dan Markell comes home from this business trip. He's this mm -hmm. FSU professor and he comes home and there's literally like nothing in the house. Everything mm -hmm. is gone. Um, basically the only thing left is this couple's shared bed. Is that, you know, just in your own experience, is this severe that someone goes away, comes home and it's just gone. Everything has disappeared. That is, I would say, less than 5% of cases you're going to see that. And I work with the world's richest people getting divorced. So mm. I see some crazy things within the aspects of what they can do to spend money during a divorce. Um, they could do that. And I do not see it often. It is rare. So that's a huge, huge um, think about that psychologically because I'm in financial psychology. The emotions that we play into every day of our lives, 85% of our decisions are made around money and emotions. 
if he's coming home, think of the emotions that are coming through all of his body. He's not going to be thinking straight. And whatever she did to make those decisions, she's not thinking straight either. So both of them have to have all these emotions and it has to do with divorce and money. So mm. pretty intense. Um, so by the way, shout out to Philadelphia shoulder surgeon, which is hard to say, especially a few times fast. Can't believe the then fiance didn't say, see you later. That's, she did. Yeah. We we got well, stories. We had all the stories. Yeah, you might have to stay tuned for another episode or tune I, in to X Experts, our first yeah. episode of our Divorce Etc. Divorce podcast. I, I think I'm going to have to bring you two on on a Sunday night. That's when we do like UFO shows and other interesting shows. And, and we'll crazy just, gossip. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just go deep it. on this. But Olivia, I'm fascinated because you just said, uh, without giving names, do we know some of your clients? Would we know some yes. of your clients? We yes. would. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how this is so to me, this is fascinating. This is really a niche area. Yes. Um, how did you develop this? How did these very wealthy people know to come to you? So um, I grew up in an ultra high net worth family and I was involved in seeing my parents atrocious, devastating divorce and it revolved all around money. So I got into finance. I left my family and didn't talk to them again. Um, this was probably 20 years ago at this point and didn't want anything to do with their divorce, got into finance. So no one could control me with money and I could help other people save and get into investing and do it the right way of retirement and, and the right things within that world. Then I got into the divorce world because I realized I needed to go to therapy and understand how much my parents' divorce affected me negatively went through therapy, started my firm so that I can help other ultra high net worth families specifically who a lot of people bash on, of course, but they have emotions too. And if I can help the parents not fight it out like my parents did, their children will be affected in a positive way. Do it, do make it positive. You don't have to have these vicious divorces that last 10 years. And, and let me ask you, Olivia, in your own experience, because I'm always very curious about this. I'm one of these guys, and I speak about this a lot in the book, to go back to the book again. Sorry about that. But um, I talk a lot about how I never thought about money. I just wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to get to the national level. It was, you know, I had career aspirations. I, I, I made it happen, I think. But I never thought about money. But now that I, you know, I got married later and had kids later in life, um, I'm, I'm very concerned about it because it is important. Do you find that these ultra wealthy people are generally happy or unhappy? Oh, I mean, let's go in the context of overall, 97% of us in America have anxiety around money. It doesn't matter our wealth level. Mm -hmm. So doesn't matter because I work with billionaires, uber wealthy, hundreds of millions, or you could have a thousand dollars in a bank account you're going to have emotions around money and it does not make your life easier and better and less complex. The more money you get, you're not going to all of a sudden be happier. So yes, I see people in the worst times of their life in divorce and they have money, but even when they're not going through divorce, it doesn't make them happy. You really have to do the work on yourself. And like you're saying for yourself, Joel, you can't really avoid it. If you can, you're just going to have that anxiety in the background. So facing it like you are now and acknowledging that you have that it's really that's where you can start doing the work on yourself around money wow uh by the way karma is going to absolutely throw a fit and call me a hundred percent for sure after i make this comment but if any of your clients are women in their 80s with no children um <laughs> i wouldn't mind meeting them and they have no family members <laughs> um just send them my way my wife will understand um sorry about that. <laughs> jessica yeah um, 20 months after Dan shows up at his house and everything is basically gone, we'll go through the list of the things that were taken. Um, he wi winds up shot in the head in his driveway. Um, he dies the next day on July 19th. Uh, horrific crime scene. Horrific. Um, this is obviously as severe as it gets. The motive for this is believed to be, of course, you know, custody issues and divorce. How often do you see it get not to the necessarily the level? Have you seen other murders personally uh, that with people you've dealt with? But how how often does it get very serious and very severe to this? You know, not to this extent, but close. So first of all, sorry for the ambulance outside because I'm in New yep. York City. So if you New can York, hear that, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, look, there are statistics out there. 34% of women die at the hands of an intimate partner, while only 6% of men die at the hands of an intimate partner. But those aren't necessarily specifically broken down in terms of divorce. I mean, we do see those kinds of stories, but we, all of us as a society are fascinated by them because when you get divorced, I, I happen to have had two very amicable divorces, but as we know, many people have very vindictive, acrimonious divorces. And so there's always the kind of like, oh my God, it, you know, things might be so much easier if they weren't in the picture at all. But the truth is the people that are going so far as to like premeditate murder we, we look at that. We hear those first stories. We're like, they're crazy. They're psycho. They're not because they are smart enough and rational enough to know that they are, they need to get somebody else to do it. They need to go through the steps it takes to actually set it up. They know it's wrong. So they, they aren't psychotic in that regard. They're just dumb because they think that somehow their phone isn't being tracked. They think that somehow you know, people aren't going to be able to figure out that the police aren't going to be able to figure out. I mean, in the Adelson case, the fact that they were able to track down that car, mm -hmm. like through the cameras on the city buses, I, I think that it generally, when we hear about cases of murder after divorce, it is usually either something regarding greed or something regarding kids. The, the sad part is that people don't understand that as much as my mother was like, you know, we should kill, you know, Darren after my divorce because he had cheated, which obviously she was joking about. He's alive and well. But like that would not help my kids. Now my kids are going to grow up without a dad with some kind of traumatic, even more traumatic event in their life. You know, the murder of their father, like when it gets to that point. It, it, the reason it fascinates us is because, you know, we all have these like fleeting thoughts, but it's like, holy shit, someone actually went ahead mm -hmm. and took the time and invested the money and planned this whole intricate thing. I mean, I, I just think yeah. it's crazy. I, there was, I grew up in a small suburb outside of Philadelphia in South Jersey. And Jersey. Ahead, Jersey. Sorry. There was a rabbi in my mm -hmm. town that I grew up with. I remember this. Who, yes. Yeah. Huge story. Who hired a hitman to kill his wife rather than getting divorced. Turned out he had been having an affair. He had three kids. You know, we were in high school with them. Like we knew this is a family in a small town. Like we all knew each other. And I, and I like covered the story for work. I was at CBS at the time, but like it, so whether it's a periodontist or whether it's a, you know, King's gang member or whatever it is, like this guy was a rabbi who somehow had a connection that was able to find someone to like bludgeon the wife in her home. I mean, it it knows no bounds with regards to socioeconomic class yeah. in the end. Well, TH, what about red flags too? I mean, I'm sure in retrospect, you guys saw a lot of red flags when you were kind of dissecting what happened to the two of you, meaning Jessica and TH and even Olivia. But at the wedding, this is Linda Mon or Moan, uh, Wendy was planning their divorce during her wedding. That is not, I not kosher. So Dan was becoming, uh, someone says divorce equals war of the roses. So mm. at this wedding, Dan was becoming more involved in Judaism, becoming more religious. And it was important for him to have kosher food and for some of the guests and they show up at the wedding and the Adelsons pull the kosher food. There's no kosher food there. What about this level of animosity and hostility from the get go, is that, I mean, it's got to be a massive red flag, right? TH? It, it's definitely a red flag. And I, I also felt red flags. I mean, you feel it, but you don't believe it. You get caught up in all of it. You're, you're at your beautiful wedding and this is the day you've been planning and you just go along with it. Maybe you can let this go and give them a break and not be so worried about it. It's our wedding day, like the pressure of a wedding and everybody's watching you. Those red flags are gonna are gonna be stomped on and not really acknowledged at all because you so badly want things to be good. And you're kind of in this vicious cycle now. We're getting married, it's romantic, we have a honeymoon, we have all these plans. 
And then you feel like, am I going to be the one to screw it up now, even though they pulled the kosher food and, you know, you weren't the one to disrupt anything, but you're the one who's going to speak up. So you're kind of being the one that's going to screw it up, right? Because you're speaking up, which is not actually the case. And we don't promote that. We do promote you speaking up. But I understand the pressure, especially at the wedding, to not speak up. We see red flags all the time. And fear prevents us from moving forward. Well, but this is going to happen or that's going to happen or you just, it's not worth the fight. So you ignore the red flag. Wow. That's uh, dangerous. By the way, here's Philadelphia shoulder surgeon again. By the way, Philadelphia, I did not forget about you. I'm going to touch base. Um, different MOs. My dad's frat bro was definitely murdered by his wife, but he died in his sleep. 50s, healthy. COE, I hope you're not up to no good. That is the wife. And wife had him cremated immediately. May happen more than we know. Some people do get uh -huh. away with crimes. Uh, that is uh, scary. But Olivia, back to you. Mm -hmm. Um what is the divorce rate right now? I know a bunch of years back, it was well over 50%. And what do you attribute it to? So it's, it's around that number still. I would say it's higher and we can have TH. Maybe you want to say a different number, um, but you both might be also nodding. So I think that we're probably on the same page there. Um, some counties and some cities and some states might be uh, a level higher. Um, I would... Obviously, I work and I have a huge bias when I work in the financial field and divorce. So I would say all money problems, and this has been statistically proven that the number one reason for people getting divorced is money over money issues, over money fights. And that is what I do. So again, my bias is most likely they're 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 gonna get divorced because the money and either not communicating clearly or having fear, just like TH was saying maybe even before you get married, the prenup discussion, um, if the one spouse is more controlling or the whole family behind the scenes is controlling, you don't wanna be the person speaking up if you've been planning this beautiful wedding. Um, and that just, that that would be my number one guess. Mm. Uh, 1776 daughter here says, never marry someone you've cheated with. As Dr. Phil said, if they'll do it with you, they'll do yes. it to you. Um, Jessica, you agree with this sentiment? I I totally do. And I just have to say, when my ex went on to cheat on the woman that he had cheated on me with, if you're following that, he had this affair, we we broke up, he, they were together, and then he cheated on her. And then the original woman called me at work to be like, I can't believe it. He cheated on me. Who does that? I'm like, seriously? <laughs> I, I, I said, I can't say I'm that surprised. He has done it before. So I just, it was so ironic and kind of that like, look, poetic justice. Like I really am not like that person, but I'm not going to lie. Like that felt let good. me, let me, I mean, I'm, I was about to say, I don't want to get too personal, but this is obviously very personal. Why do you think Jessica, why do you think he was cheating? Um, do you think he was just immature at the time bored? Oh. What was, what was the motivation? Well, at the time I that is sort of what I thought. Like, I was like, well, you know, we had young kids and I'm like, you know, kids ruin everything. And then like, you know, you're not paying as much attention. I was working a crazy high pressure job with ridiculous hours. Like, I, I mean, I really just thought it was kind of the standard things. Like you, you know, you don't have enough time for each other and the communication had sort of broken down. That was what I believed. Um, but then I went on to watch him consistently cheat on in other relationships. And so now I feel like some of what I felt I had initially taken responsibility for in terms of my part in like us not communicating. It's not that I, I still think that to some extent, but I, I think that it wouldn't have mattered. I, 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 because supposedly whatever he learned from our relationship and was like, you know, was going to have better communication and was going to act different ways in future relationships. It doesn't seem to have made a difference <laughs> in the end. So I, I think I don't believe in the concept of like once a cheater, always a cheater. I really don't. I really do think that there are different circumstances and people can change. I just don't think he has. I think that it's it's his character. Well, he hasn't. Right. I mean, even in recent. Yeah, I, it's his character. And so yeah. I think it's, it is what it is. And so look, thank God I got divorced. Right? Because... 
then that would have been me in, in potentially perpetual situations. Yeah. You know, one of the issues with this and, you know, suicide, I guess, could be compared not to get like macabre on everybody. But they say that, you know, some huge percentage of people that attempt suicide or commit suicide, if they 48 hours later, they're in a different, totally different state of mind with divorce. As you're going through it, it's it, it has to be the worst thing in the world. It's horrific. But then you fast forward and you look at you two, at, you know, the three of you, actually, and you guys are, le you know, living happy, productive lives. You got yourselves on track. So if you are going through this, I mean, I would just caution everybody to, you know, it's going to be a rocky road for a little bit, but then things are going to get much better. My TH, is that correct? Yeah. Absolutely. My divorce took four years. He was engaged to somebody and he dragged me through the courts for four years, had experts come in questioning my parenting. He was MIA for four years. All of a sudden he's worried about me being a good mom and my employability um, status and viability of a job. I had a master's degree. I had no problem in getting it. I was working. He wanted me to get a better job. So four years it took to get a divorce from him. And it just, uh, I, all I can say is that the business of divorce is what sucks because the courts are antiquated. If you hire the wrong lawyers or your lawyer and your ex's lawyer are battling it out, like you need, you need the universe to align to have experts and have somewhat of a reasonable divorce. I know that Olivia does collaborative divorce and mediation. We didn't have all of that. I was forced into mediation from my third judge. Wow. Um, so, and then we settled on the day of trial because whatever woke up in him, woke up in him. And what? that was it. So the business side of divorce sucks. That's why we created X experts because we'll help you navigate all of it. You're not going to spend the kind of money I spent and you're going to handle difficult situations better than we knew how. But the emotional side, get yourself a great therapist, wear your girlfriends through it all. So we'll hear it all about dating and moving on and bullshit that happens on the weekends. And you're going to be great. You don't have to wait for the divorce to be signed and sealed to start moving forward with your life and taking care of you, which is exactly what I did. And that's how we are where we are. Yeah, speaking of going through the courts, Scott Donuts is a friend of ours from Toronto. My husband's divorce from his ex lasted 15 years in court with lawyers. And then yeah. what was this comment here? Um, my ex-husband owes me a half a million dollars in child support from Matt, yet I would never kill him because my kids would lose their father. Exactly. But, you know, right. and, and Jessica was saying this earlier, you know, people probably do think this, and this is probably one of the reasons Dan Markell uh, Wendy Adelson story is so riveting. Uh, you know, there's a story, Jody Plouche, who I've had on this show. He was totally different, but similar because people always say what I'm, when I tell you the story, Jody Plouche was sexually molested by a man, uh, his karate teacher. This was back in 1984. He was abducted and they ultimately arrested the person that committed this crime. They brought him back to Louisiana where Jody Plouche, Jody, Jody's a man, by the way, young mm. boy at the time, and waiting in the airport was the father, um, and his name is Gary Plouche, and Gary, Gary Plouche on television, on the news, uh, shot this guy and killed him. And the reason that story fascinated you know, so many people is, God forbid it happens to your child, but you hear so many parents of children who've gone through that say, I want to kill this person. And this guy, Gary Plouche, did it. And so, um, again, this is why I think that there's also a tremendous fascination uh, with this case. But, um, Olivia, back to you here. Uh, when Sigfredo Garcia, who's the convicted trigger man serving a life sentence for this, was ar arrested back in 2016, the the uh, arrest affidavit, the, the probable cause in there, the motive uh, for more for murder uh, was listed. One of the reasons was de uh, divorce and they listed the details of the divorce. I asked, I think the other to this earlier on, but how often do you see very extreme cases when it comes to divorce, not necessarily murder, but otherwise extreme? Um, extreme. I mean, I would almost want a definition because I could say most of my cases are pretty intense. 
and complex. I would say though, if we're talking extreme, like murder or something of that nature, it's not very many. Um, just like we were talking about um, clearing out the entire house. That's, I don't see it as often as you would think, because when we look at the news, we're triggering our amygdala when we watch something so negative it's giving us an excitement and an adrenaline and that gives ratings to the tv shows so they're trying to show negativity in a way that's fascinating to us so you're seeing the one-offs but day to day i have extreme cases but not to that level not to that level mm. we, uh, we actually we oh, actually speak with a lot of people who suffer through different forms of abuse. It's not always physical. A lot of the time it's financial. So you were saying, you know, that's the number one reason for divorce, but that's also a top reason why people are afraid to get a divorce Yeah, because of financial abuse, emotional abuse, and the courts don't recognize those forms of abuse. Uh, they recognize a bruise um, and documented bruising with police and with reports. So I would, you know, back to your question towards Olivia, I mean, in extreme cases, really in that case, and then you have alcohol and drug abuse and 24% of, ma of marriages end in divorce because of the abuse of alcohol. And the divorce rate is higher than the homicide rate right now. So there's a lot of things going on, but a lot of people are really afraid to get a divorce because of emotional, financial, and physical abuse. And, and TH, in your opinion, how is technology, the fact that people can swipe right or swipe left or whatever they can do with technology, how has that impacted marriages and ultimately divorces? I am glad that Jessica and I got sep were separated from our husbands in 2008 when this was less of an issue. And when we created X experts three years ago, it's because of technology. I'm looking online and I'm like, holy crap, we have to help people now because now identity theft, tracking, you have deep fakes on AI, people being falsely accused of abuse and addiction through a deep fake on AI. That's not even them. And then they have to spend the time defending themselves. So technology is very dangerous. You have to be very careful. If you're in a difficult situation, first and foremost, if you are in any kind of danger or your children are, you must go get help immediately. Go to the police, go to your local shelter, um, but be very careful also if you're planning a divorce or you're thinking about it, there are things that you should do to protect your privacy, stay away from social media, don't be swiping, everything is trackable on your phone and your computer. And Jessica, they always say, first of all, that uh, family court is much more dangerous than criminal court, but also trying to leave a domestic situation, um, you know, whether it's domestic violence or you're trying to end your marriage, they always say that's the most dangerous part of the journey. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And the reason is because there are, you know, people are in relationships and they know that their spouse is going to act out and react in a scary and negative way if they actually tell them it really has come to the end of the line. So it's always scary. I mean, even for people who aren't in abusive relationships, the, getting to the end and having to tell their spouse, like, this is it, I'm leaving, we're getting divorced is extremely scary because you don't know how people are going to react. So yeah, I agree with that 100%. Mm. Uh, D love of God, this is... Uh, Olivia, hang on. Ooh, did she just... Hang, give me one sec, Olivia. I'm going to come right to you. D love of God... Wendy can blame Nancy Grace. Uh, I was on Nancy's show this week. Uh, shout out to Nancy. Uh, but she erased Dan from his children in name and every aspect seems suspicious. So Wendy Adelson was on the stand during this trial and basically said that she changed the kids' names from Markel to Adelson because Nancy Grace uh, mentioned them and outed them, which is a lot of BS in my opinion. Olivia, this is, again, just a form of hostility you know, mm -hmm. literally co-opting the children and taking uh, back the name. Uh, what do you make of this? And I didn't mean to interrupt, so please follow. No, no worries. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a form of control and it could be, we can look at it at two points of view. We could try our best to say, well, she is trying to protect them from other people seeing who they are in school and not following the name the rest of their lives. 
But most likely there's more of a negative spin and it is a form of control of, of showing I have the control, I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'm going to continue to have my kids be exactly where I want them to be. And you do see that of she's, she's getting what she wants right now. So it's kind of interesting that that's that you would choose that path during such a publicly held forum. It's just funny too and ironic that like so she changed the kid's name to the Adelsons and I feel like right now I don't think the Adelson name is any better. That's <laughs> yeah, name I was anyway. that too. You probably yeah. would have been better off leaving it. It's <laughs> markedly worse, I can tell you that. It's a hell of a lot worse. Cass change Cassidy. It to Smith or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just bought Ruth Markell's book, The Unveiling, an amazing book. It's heartbreaking. Uh what Wendy has done, shame on the Adelsons. Mm -hmm. It really is horrible. So, um Dan in as we all know, Dan was an attorney and so was Wendy Adelson in his uh, divorce motions. Uh, he called his family's exodus, them leaving a quote unquote plundering and his worst nightmare, which is a cliche in the news business. But it is a cliche for a reason, because it really, I'm sure, was his worst nightmare. And when when he came home that that fateful night in 2012 and basically sees everything in his home gone, he likens it to the uh, infamous Pearl Harbor attacks. He's a lot smarter than me, so he says it a lot better. And I quote here, I don't even know what this means, but a, a Visigoth, a Visigoth, I've never heard of that word, a Visigoth-like sacking of the marital home, part of a Pearl Harbor-style separation. This is why Dan went to Harvard and I went to Brandeis. But um, <laughs> these are these are are, are really heart-wrenching words um jessica you know he literally says a plundering a worst nightmare pearl harbor attack by the way the things that were taken furniture and belongings dan wrote when he got back that that day there were no pajama bottoms no diapers no wipes not even the older boy's bed remained at the house so it was horrific but what do you make of this language that it was a pearl harbor harbor style attack it just goes to show, I think, how severely people take this and how seriously they take it and how hurt they are. I have a little bit of a different take on it. I mean, again, having been through two divorces, it's devastating. It sucks. There's no getting around it. It doesn't matter whether you're the one initiating the divorce or whether you're the one who's being told that you're that you're getting a divorce. Like, it's awful. Um, however, on the other side, and, and so I don't want to minimize the trauma of divorce. But I also think that this guy as a Harvard educated lawyer and as this like brilliant man was able to use his words in ways that were much more creative and much more colorful than the average person. And that's what lawyers do in general. I mean, that's their job. So if he was writing those documents on behalf of a client, I think that he, he may have used the same words not to minimize the severity of the situation. But I do think that part of his whole point was to use words that made it like the worst ever. So I, I'm a little bit mixed on that one point. Um, MEF 561, we'll go with that. Sometimes these are like reading license plates. I have no idea what I'm reading, but uh, <laughs> Donna was planning Wendy's divorce at the wedding. And then there's a uh, question here. Uh, Wendy said it was a miscommunication about the kosher food. Seemed like she said there were two different kosher types. Can you explain those differences? I'm no rabbi, but I know a little bit. There's something called glock kosher, which is like extremely kosher, where very religious Jews will eat it. And then there's kind of kosher style. Uh, but it was my understanding that Dan wanted it to be more than kosher style. Uh, he wanted it to be kosher. They did not. Um, do you think, though, TH, that this divorce was being planned from the get go? Do you, do you agree with that? You know, it's really hard to know, but I want to go back to Dan for a minute. And the thing that keeps coming up is poor communication, mm -hmm. poor communication about the kosher food, poor communication, probably in his marriage, which is why he was so shocked that the house was empty. He may have been missing a lot that was going on. Maybe there wasn't even good communication between the two of them. I don't know if a divorce was planned at the wedding. I mean, I'm I would bet that my mother was hoping for a divorce or maybe the wedding wouldn't go through until the party was over. And then we get divorced right when the party's done. She spent so much effort planning my wedding, but uh, she didn't like him. And so, you know, there's that. So I'm not really sure. It's hard to know what people are saying. You hope that everybody has 
you know, your happiness in their hearts at your wedding and everybody's filled with love. So it's, it would be upsetting to think someone's like conniving and being like planning the divorce. Maybe they were just thinking this isn't going to work out too long. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, side Barbie here. Never marry without a prenup. Olivia, this is uh, your wheelhouse, I think. Um, what do you think about this, Olivia? And also, these uber wealthy people with literally billions of dollars, they have so mm -hmm. much disposable income. Are mm -hmm. they willing to give it up to get the divorce? Or are they clinging on to their money? Most of the time, it's such an emotional process that they're trying to hurt each other by holding on to it, even though they could let go of let's just say 60 million extra or um, give <laughs> another 80,000 in alimony a month. It's not going to hurt them at all. It's, it's more of a emotional targeting, almost like, I think Jessica, you talked about how money and children are a lot of the contentious issues that I agree. Children can be used as pawns, just like my childhood. And then also money again, my childhood too, but in this situation, um, and who I deal with, it's mostly those two are the scenarios and money prenups. We could talk about that for hours on if a prenup is right for you or not. It doesn't matter if you have wealth or not. It's a good conversation to have because it forces you as an almost married couple to talk about your finances. Do you both have debt? So everyone listening today, if you haven't talked to your significant other, your partner, your lover, your soon to be married partner, whoever you're just dating, talk about the money that you have, your fears, your anxieties, and have your other person in the relationship talk about theirs. Do they have debt? Do they want to go back to school? Who's going to stay home and, and watch the children if you're going to take out your career from that? How are you going to get compensated? Because it will come back to bite you if you got divorced. And I mean, the statistics are... Some of us will on this call today if we're about to get married. So mm. know, know about the money. And well, even Olivia, if you're already married oh. and you don't have a prenup, you can have the discussion that Olivia is talking about and you can get a postnup. Like let's, you can still let's be, protect yourself in that way. Be careful with postnups and make sure you have the right foundation and the right people. I agree. You, you, you can protect yourself, but be careful on that. Um, there's a lot of avenues that could go wrong on that way. Um, but go, now, go on. I'm asking this for a friend. How do you bring that up at a marriage? <laughs> okay. So there's stigma still there's taboo still. And the way that I like to do it. So anyone can use this, even if you don't have a financial planner or advisor or a coach that you're not using one of us, or you're not using someone who's helping you get married. Um, cause there's a lot of dating coaches now you can say, I've been talking to a financial planner or you've gone to a hotline. There's a lot of financial resources and you've talked to someone and they're telling me, or you've listened to a podcast and these experts who are in the financial field are saying that we should talk about money. I'm not sure. I feel uncomfortable, but maybe we should talk about money and prenups. That's the advice I'm getting. So you can either blame it on a specific financial planner, advisor, mm. expert that you coach, or you can say you've heard about it. You've read about it. Bring it up and blame it on someone else. Don't take the brunt yeah. of it, but do bring it up. COE, don't, don't I was just your, on the phone. Don't tell your yeah. wife that you're listening to a podcast on prenups. And I bet you she's listening right now. COE, I was just talking to Charles Schwab. Oh, boy. I'm here, Joel. <laughs> Insert eye roll. I love it. My, my, she was my, actually going to talk to you about it. Tonight. Listen, <laughs> my wife is very sharp and uh she would destroy me if i ever if the coe ditches me i'm going ted kaczynski style minus the bombs but i'm just <laughs> i'm moving into like a one room cabin in the middle of nowhere and i'm just gonna get three dogs and keep use them to stay warm and hang out but i'm done i'm checking out if that happens so if the if the podcast stops running one day you'll know why um i don't have the energy i don't understand how these guys have the energy to cheat women cheat too but I, I literally don't understand how people have the uh, energy. Look at Chase here with the deep question, what happened to true love? So the bigger part, Carmen's going to yell at me this, at the, about this too because I keep bringing up this book. But my mom was – my dad just passed away, which I still can't believe. I'm but and he was almost He was almost 90. But my parents were married close to 64 years, and uh, they were still madly in love. They would still hold hands. Uh, there's not a day that went by where my mom did not scream at my dad. Let's make that clear. But they were uh, madly in love. And so a big part of this book 
Uh, you know, she went through the Holocaust. She lost a child. But the biggest trauma she's experienced is the loss of her husband. And we talk about that. But what about this little question, TH? What happened to true love? Do we have to ask Carm? True love is out there. I have found true love. I am mm. in. I found my forever man. But I will mm. tell you that you meet people where you are. So if you haven't done the work for yourself, then you're gonna meet other people who haven't done really the work for themselves either. And you'll probably get along just fine until one of you outgrows the other and starts working and growing and learning about themselves and appreciating themselves. When I came out of my marriage, I couldn't even hold somebody's hand. Someone went to hold my hand and I pulled my hand away. And in that moment, I was like, he's a nice guy, but I should not be dating. I am like, definitely need help. And I still dated because that's how I learned, you know, what was right, what was wrong. And when I met the man who I'm with now, I had honestly blown him off. I was on a dating tear. I was out of control. I'm done. So I blew him off. And then I ran into him at the vet. And there was something about him that was different than any other guy. I'd been in two serious relationships after my marriage. And now we're together five years. So I believe in true love. I believe that you can find your person. You're just going to find your right person when you have arrived. When you and have, when you're your best self, then you're going to meet someone else who's their best self and you meet at the same level. And when I met my husband, um, I was 22 years old. I knew nothing. I should have done what you did, Joel. I got married way too young. I got caught up in the whole wedding thing. It yeah. definitely had red flags early on. And then it just all kind of blew up after my youngest was born. Yeah. So I don't know about, you know, because I'm from New Jersey and New York. But in New York, there's this crazy pressure, especially for young women. Uh, more so, I think, to just get married. There's, you know, the friends are starting to get married and there's this pressure that builds. So you've kind of got to resist that. I don't want to get personal again, but are you going to marry this guy, TH? You're not married to him, are you? We are not. We own a home together and we did a cohabitation agreement mm. because I want yes. to safeguard. Uh, we should each be safeguarded. So it's wow. like a prenup for a serious relationship where you own a home, you live together, your kids, you're blending your families and everything. My answer to that is I said I would never get married again, not a shot in hell until I met him. So if it becomes a topic of conversation for us, which it hasn't, because we have everything. I don't need a marriage certificate. I've got everything that I need. But if it comes to that, he's the only one. There you go. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Uh, hey, Mona says, screaming is part of Carm's love language. <laughs> it certainly is. Um, Wesley John Holmes, an Australian living in Tokyo. Uh, true love is working 15 hours a day for free for your husband's <laughs> podcast. You wish you worked 15 hours. That's like a fraction. You work 15 seconds. We need to get you up to at least an hour and a half to get you up there. Um, sorry, having marital issues on the air. Um, so there was only one thing left still on Dan's uh, home here. When he gets back, there was just this crib mattress on the floor. One of the things she took, besides hundreds of thousands of dollars, this is Wendy, in cash and equities uh, from their bank account, was this Holocaust diamond. This is a family heirloom, and she's never given it back. Olivia, you know, you're dealing with very wealthy people. There's got to be family heirlooms, but this... You know, as the son of a Holocaust survivor, this really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, Ruth Markell, I know, has brought this up, um, you know, that the family has never gotten it back. There's some things money can't buy, right? But it, it, is there any way for the Markells to get this back? So I don't know if there's any evidence or documentation. I don't know about that part in the case. But if I were part of the family and I wanted to heirloom back, I would absolutely be fighting with that with the right lawyer. and. You can hire private investigators. I've had clients do that. I have my little strings that I pull and bring in the right professionals because I don't do it all. I can find hidden assets. I can do the splitting of assets and analysts part in the divorce with money. Um, and a lot of times there's safe deposit boxes everywhere around the world. And there's a lot of things inside of those. But if you're finding an heirloom that's priceless, it doesn't matter the cost, 
you got to get the right people involved to find it. And if you are, again, listeners, if you're about to go through divorce or you're thinking of it or not even, take photos of some of your valuables like those family heirlooms because then you have proof that you've had it. You have proof of where it was on certain days. Since, but I would, I would get the right people involved to fight that. This is true. I'm getting out of hand tonight. I'm going to get ripped apart by the wife and my mother double when they gang up on me, by the way. Um, so Wendy finally files for divorce on September 10th, 2012. The details of the agreement are as follows. The agreement included a 50, 50 custody arrangement, Jessica, and shared parenting guidelines. Uh, Dan Markell would have to pay Wendy Adelson $841 per month, as well as a $120,000 lump sum payment. He got the house, investment accounts, vehicles, and other property were divided between the two. I mean, I have a serious question here. She was working. She was a, a law professor as well at the time. Why is it that the man is always paying the woman? Why is that? I mean, it it's overwhelming majority of the time it's the man paying the woman but we know it's not always the case and we've heard some huge high profile cases kelly clarkson's paying her husband alimony britney spears was paying alimony so it isn't always the case but it is certainly more common that the, that the man is paying and it also depends like they may have both you know she was a lawyer and a, and a law professor he may have made more money than she did i mean just in the breakdown of the assets and olivia i'm sure can attest to this in a, in a better way financially but like it really is you're breaking everything down i i have to say and things vary state by state 841 dollars a month for child support is yeah. really really low so Maybe that was like the compensation, you know, or the, or the compromise with how they were splitting things up that he only had to pay $841 a month. I don't know anyone who got away with it that easy. Um, that, that So it really, there are so many moving parts and there are so many variables. And I know play, situations where the man gets the house and you know, but he has, still has to buy her out of the house and then she gets other types of assets in return. It's, it does become very complicated. I'll, I'll default to Olivia for that, but it, it's generally stereotypically in our society, the men make more than the women. And I think that that's what we see when it comes to how, you know, things are split in divorce. Uh, Dre Latina. Uh, marriage is about love. Divorce is mm -hmm. about money. 100%. Olivia, is, is that is that accurate, Olivia? I really think that we could work together, Dralatina, because that is exactly <laughs> you could totally be my sidekick here. That's exactly what it is. It is all about and it's a business transaction. So it's no longer about love. It's about a business transaction and non emotionally as much as you can. It is all about the money. It is. Uh, and of course, children. But let's we're talking about the money. So. Yeah. Uh, so, hey, Mona, who's a big friend of the show here, wasn't Dan and Wendy's divorce binder 900 pages long? I'll be honest. I don't know that I've ever heard that. I know that in the ja uh, Shannon Gardner, Jared Bridegan uh, divorce, there was, I think, 900 motions filed. Uh, what's the longest case file any of the guests have had? Uh, TH, have you seen a divorce binder that's more than 900 pages? Probably um, hers. I don't remember the I size think... of my binder. But I do know that I was on record as the longest divorce case in Bergen County at that time. So I'm sure I had multiple binders that were hundreds of pages long. It was four years and multiple experts, three judges, a mediator, a legal panel. Everybody gets a binder. So mm. I, I think I think I was probably pretty close. Wow. Um Jessica, back to you. So really the end, when the divorce went through, that's when a lot began. That's when the bitterness really started. They started to argue over everything, financial disclosures, family heirlooms, signing up the boys for soccer, even snacks, what, what they were going to have they went uh, when they went to McDonald's. Uh, the main issue, of course, where to raise the boys. That is the, kind of the epicenter of this whole uh, horrible saga is, you know, Don Adelson, according to everyone, wanted those kids in Miami, not in Tallahassee. Uh, but do you find that 
the divorce goes through and then it, it even exacerbates after that. I think it takes a certain kind of person's character for the divorce to get to that point after it's been settled. And so sometimes it's sort of premeditated in the sense that someone didn't get the way, it the way that they wanted to in the divorce. So they're going to push things, push, 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 push as much as they can after the divorce to push things to a head. So that then they have proof, so to speak, that they can take to a judge and say, you see, they're not abiding by this, or they're making it so much more difficult in this way or this way. So yes, it can get worse after the divorce. We hear about people going back for motions post-divorce all the time, trying to change custody situations. This person's not following, you know, this clause in the divorce contract at the end of the day, and obviously these are extreme cases, but when TH and I are working with people and the stuff that we're talking about on Divorce Etc. podcast, on the YouTube, on our YouTube channel, it's about you have to pick your battles. When you're going in and you are negotiating a divorce settlement, you have to understand that this is an agreement that you are going to have to live with for the rest of your life. And that whoever your ex is, is, is going to be someone that is going to be part of your life every single day until you die, because they are the parent, the other parent of your children. So figure it out. Don't sign an agreement that you're unhappy with, but work with a team that's going to be reasonable and rational, rational enough to let you know that you have to pick your battles. You know, they say the perfect divorce agreement is when both parties walk away unhappy. No one is ever going to win everything that they want in a divorce agreement. You have to figure out how hard are you going to fight for this versus this, which is the more important point to you. And it, and it sounds like the fact that they had these kind of issues after the divorce is that they just got to a point where they were just signing it. And then she was just going to go nuts and start complaining about everything. Man, human beings are very complicated creatures. Look at this. This is uh, the COE right here, the chief of everything. And she's commenting to someone because I am sure I butchered Dr. Latina. She, it's a, she's a, a, a doctor in a Latin country, I guess, because they're making fun of me in the chat. But long story short, that's the COE. And she's speaking her fluent Espanol. But in Miami, every time I don't speak a lick of Spanish. The COE never uses her Spanish in Miami. It's like it blows my. That's that's another uh, marital issue. I'm gonna have to get in touch with you guys because <laughs> everyone in Miami speaks Spanish, and uh, the COE just refuses to use her Spanish every time we need it. I don't understand it. Um, this is a really important question, by the way. If you do have questions, do what Smile More did and give me those capital Q's so I know here. Uh, Olivia, I'm gonna go to you here. Uh, what advice do you give women in their mid thirties and older that are shamed for being single and having no kids mm -hmm. and that they can never find someone at that age? So I am in my younger thirties and I do not have children by choice and I'm the one who asked for the divorce. So I'm single mm -hmm. by choice as well. So thank you smile more for that question. I think we're going to go to what TH said is work on yourself. I mean, yes, we can't sit here and say, we don't care what other people think. Don't care what other people think. Cause that's not going to happen. We're all human beings. Psychologically, we are going to care what people think because that's being safe in a tribe. So yes, we're going to care what people think, but work on yourself, love yourself, do the work that you can and do things that you enjoy. And that's the best advice I can give you. And also, of course, because I'm in the financial field, understand your money. I mean, the basics, just the basics. So uh, sit down with yourself and, and treat yourself to the best glass of wine or a, um, a coffee and really understand for 15 minutes a month, okay, what is this? What is finances? Can I do budgets and research something online or listen to a good podcast on money? Because um, that'll really excel you into a different atmosphere. Um, if you understand yourself better and that revolves around finances. By the way, these are awesome best guests. So uh, if you have questions, uh, they are experts in the field of divorce. Get them in now uh, and I will ask them as we go here. Um, just before this divorce is finalized, um, Jessica, to you, right before it's finalized, Wendy asked the kids, asked to have the kids move to South Florida. Uh, in the filing, Wendy Adelson's attorney 
uh, appears intent to gain majority custody of the children, saying, and I quote here, uh, she, meaning Wendy, does not believe that a 50-50 time-sharing arrangement is in the children's best interest. The husband travels a great deal and has not been the primary caretaker of the children. This next part is interesting. The filing noted it was always the intent of Markel and Adelson to move to South Florida because Markel, a devout Jew, wanted to live in a bigger city with a larger Jewish community than Tallahassee. So the Adelsons are pulling uh, this card where they want the kids, because of Dan, to be more Jewish. At the same time, Donna Adelson is taking away the kosher food, threatening to dress these grandchildren up in Nazi uniforms. I mean, my mother's a Holocaust survivor. Jessica, your response to this, obviously very vindictive and obviously uh, relocation. The motivation here, I think. I, I it's it. I, I'm, I don't want to use the term premeditated in the wrong context, but it's almost like it was all premeditated. Like they didn't give a shit about what he thought or how he felt. They just wanted to their own little family and their own little weird, you know, that family was weird in terms of, how, you know, how they were dealing with everything. And they, they just were, that's all they cared about. They, they had no regard at all for, in my opinion, for really what was in the kid's best interest. Because I truly believe that the only time it's not in children's best interest to have a 50-50 split is if there's situations of abuse or addiction or something that's literally putting the kids at danger, in danger at home. All kids, the best way for them to grow up is to be able to have a productive relationship with both parents. Children that grow up without a father or that grow up without a mother, the, statistically, those children do not end up doing well as well as adults later. I mean, they have trauma. The emotional baggage that those kids are carrying around, meaning those kids who grow up without a good relationship with one parent is really troubling. So I don't believe at all that that they were fighting for in regard, you know, for what the kids' best interest was. I totally disagree. Mm. Uh, this is interesting to you, TH. I love the initials TH, by the way. Very Thank cool. You. Um, Moto 88. I, I should go by JW from now on. Just JW. Uh, how com how common? I'm still learning to read. How common is it for one or more in-laws to get so involved in a divorce, TH? I think it's a matter of the situation. If you set up boundaries, then your in-laws or your parents or your outlaws are not getting involved. My parents, fortunately, were all the way in Egypt when I got the phone call, which means they could not get involved and they didn't know anything until I called them in Egypt. So the universe kept them very far away from me and I could finally figure out my own stuff. My mother never met my lawyer. I had to set up boundaries for her because she would have been one of these people that we're talking about. Like she was ballistic about him and all the lies and the deceit and everything that he did. She wanted to rip his eyeballs out. I'm telling you, she could have been any of these people, certainly Donna. And the only reason she's not is because of my father, number one, and because we didn't let her. Like, she was nowhere near it. We didn't talk about it with her, none of it. And even to this day, I've been, we've been separated, what, 15 years, Jessica? So mm -hmm. I've been forced, I don't know, I can't do the math. It took me four years. So um, she's still, to this day, like, claws come out and, like, venom. If you talk about him, if you talk about their dad, but he's their dad. So I think that it's really up to the people with, you know, it's up to you with your own parents. Draw the line, draw the boundaries. If your parents are helping you financially, you still have to put up boundaries. I really appreciate the financial support. I really need it, but I don't need your opinion right now. Yeah, I'm, 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 so if anyone can... needs help with that, I'm great at drawing the line with my mom. I speak to her 73 times a day. <laughs> she runs my life. Right, if anyone you needs... have to. You have to. Uh, I'm starting uh, ex-experts uh, <laughs> mom 
the mom <laughs> division. If anyone needs help separating from the mother, we'll please start come separate to me. sessions for you. Uh, yes, McSpunky, a big friend of the show and generous. Look at him; he's got a cool looking uh, headshot there, McSpunky, looking uh, good. Uh, Joel, is your doghouse furnished? Uh, <laughs> we have a little outdoor sofa. You can sleep outside barely now. It's getting a little dipping down into the low 70s but i probably sleep on the outside couch with ethel even though ethel sleeps in my bed usually uh yala what if i just enjoy sts but it's not going to get me a man uh is that okay olivia is that okay if she's just watching the podcast but it doesn't get her a guy if you're just watching the podcast it's not gonna get a guy that's okay you don't have to have <laughs> someone to complete you keep watching Olivia, I don't want to get too personal, but since I got personal with them, can I ask you? Yes. Um, well, speaking of getting personal, I'm not even going to read this comment, but I'll let you guys read that. Uh, that's what happens, I guess, um, sometimes. I didn't read that, it. I didn't see it. <laughs> uh, well, we'll have to go scroll back. But look at this. Um, FYI, from the COE, I spoke Spanish all day. You said <coughs> you made the decision to leave your husband. Can I ask you mm -hmm. why? I outgrew him. So it's, I keep going back to TH because she keeps saying things that are very relatable. <laughs> Um, so sorry, Jessica, I'm not going back to TH today, but um, it's been absolutely, it was a 10 year relationship. I got married very young and I started to do the work on myself, went to therapy um, and realized, oh shit, I am really changing as a person and for myself and that outgrew what he wanted in his relationship. There you go. Sometimes you just outgrow each other. Mm -hmm. uh, this is so Wendy Adelson in her filing. This is a quote. Uh, she said she's divorcing the husband, Dan Markell, due to her unhappiness with him and the marriage. And the uh, and she only moved out of the home because she knew that Dan Markell would not. The filing said he simply is having difficulty accepting her decision. Mm -hmm. Dan, sh you know, took a shot at her and basically claimed in a divorce filing that she had mental health issues um, and she fired back regarding that saying that that really hurt her because she was a professor at FSU. But what about this fact that Dan, you know, said that she has mental health issues, uh, THGU again, this is now starting to beat a, a, a dead horse a little bit, but this, you could just see the, the acrimony and the animus here. They just really don't like each other. Does this is this as common as one would believe that that still um, as you're filing the divorce, but even after the divorce that you're just doing whatever you can to just irritate the crap out of the other person? I think, yes, um, because, you know, most women are crazy and all the guys are narcissists. Right. So that's what everybody's saying. And so when you meet a guy like, oh, he's so nice. And and he his ex-wife, she's nuts, right? Or the other way around, like her husband was a total sociopath. That's what everybody's saying all the time. So I think everyone's throwing a lot of words around. Um, I think that what I said before, divorce is the business side. And then depending on when you decide to work on the emotional side of things, take accountability. I was I was married to a guy who was terrible for me, like really, really bad, but I let him treat me like shit. So I had to work through all that. So I think it is normal depending on how far you're moving ahead for yourself, right? If you're not going to work on yourself and you're not going to take any accountability for how you ended in that relationship in the first place, then you probably are going to be pissed off and saying terrible things. And she's crazy. And he's the sociopath when in fact that could be the case but it isn't always the case. People are very quick to use a lot of words about other people because they want to think that they're the best and the other person is the problem and that they are not the problem at all. They're perfect. And if it wasn't for their ex, their life would be, you know, un unicorns and rainbows. Mm. Um, I'm not even going to try to say this name because I'm going to butcher it, but Joel, would you accept to be host, uh, for the view I would uh, with one condition if Barbara Walters came back from the dead and I could co-host with the yeah. famous mm -hmm. Barbara Walters and I would do it, but uh, it does. Oh, here we go. Look at this. Um, tat tatted Tara. Not all kids will end up with trauma. If one parent is involved, okay. tired of hearing that there are exceptions. Can I, can I yeah. sit? Jessica, because, please, yeah, please. Yeah, because, because you're right. 
Tara, Tara, and and I and I do apologize for totally just stereotyping that. My, I think my point was more that when a parent isn't involved because of the direct uh, effort of the other parent to make them not involved, for the kids to see that one parent is blocking them from having a relationship, as opposed to someone growing up in a single parent household, a hundred percent, they can be totally fine. It's more the animosity and the acrimony that goes into, you know, a situation like this with the Adelsons where she's trying to pull him away and not allowing the kids to see the father. That's more of the situation that I was referring to. Olivia, there's some stuff and and then we'll, I want to switch over for a few minutes. I'm abusing these lovely women's time but we're having a good time i think so we'll keep going are you guys okay to keep going for a little bit totally. Totally. Oh, okay yeah. awesome so um olivia um in the divorce filing now this is wendy adelson uh i'm sorry this is dan markell speaking of wendy adelson and find about the financial mm -hmm. sides specifically uh, in his filing he says that wendy was quote unquote not a helpless character in this drama and she helped herself to over six hundred thousand dollars in cash liquid equities and other assets upon separation he goes on he says her wealthy parents placed her in a quote-unquote financial cocoon and by paying her legal fees she was able to quote-unquote take the most aggressive and unsubstantiated legal postures possible the adelson's uh responded to that saying that that was a sham pleading but you see dan markell here calling out the adelson's because they were giving her the money, according to Dan Markell. Uh, you must see that a lot, or maybe not, because both sides mm -hmm. are usually very wealthy. But what about that? What about when one side has a lot more money than the other side? That's most cases are going to be the one person has the the finances and is the one getting the powerful lawyers and is planning the divorce years or months in advance. The other one doesn't have financial control and doesn't have any wherewithal of the finances. Uh, so in this case, it's a little different because they both had the jobs and stability and money, and they both seem like they know a little bit about things going on, but her parents helping her does happen more often than you'd think. Um, and it does put her in her financial cocoon. She can protect herself and go get a more aggressive attorney. I don't recommend getting an aggressive attorney, even if you can afford it. Go a different route if you possibly can. Talk to different people in the divorce field um, and do the work on yourself. But if that's the path you go, yeah, if you have the money and you're getting a more aggressive attorney, you're going to be able to have that control more easily than the other spouse if they don't have financial control. I will point out the 600000 that she took. You can in a divorce or before the divorce, as long as there's no actual legal substances saying you cannot um, go forward like a motion saying or some kind of lawyer telling you you're not allowed to touch the assets and there's nothing of that nature, you can pull half of an account if it's joint. So if they had an account with 1.5 million, you can take 600 that day. That's not illegal. Is that a good idea? No. Is that normal behavior in a marital home? No. And will that have to be placed back? Yes. In a normal divorce proceeding and everything's traceable. So for me, I would be able to find that in a second and it wouldn't be a big deal um long answer there no oh, no it makes a lot of sense kevin hornbuckle says boundaries got dan markell killed uh there is something to be said about that um in this this is an interest very this is a very important topic i know to ruth markell but more about grandparents and i'm going to read this quote the motion uh that dan had written at the time says that donna adelson is a source of parental alien uh, alienation efforts and he condemned his ex-wife for violating their parenting agreement by letting her mother take care of the boys without first asking if dan uh, markell could watch them and then the motion asserts that on three different occasions after the children spent time with donna uh jessica i'm going to toss this to you the boys reported back to dan markell and i quote here grandma says you're stupid when Dan Markell asked why she would say that, the boys replied, she says you are trying to take her sunshines from her. Uh, what about this, Jessica, where, you know, either the parent, the other, the spouse and or the grandparents are now bad mouthing 
the other person and going so far as to call them stupid. You know they're doing this, it behind the back, but what about This is a real thing, and it's a real problem in many, many divorces. This is not just the minority of cases. P parental alienation is a real thing, um, and, it, and it can become a huge issue in divorce. It's very hard to prove. Listen, I, I think that my ex and I did a, really a good job in terms of having an amicable divorce, and there were still times when my kids came back when they were little and- shit would fall out of their mouth that I'm sure my outlaws didn't mean for my kids to repeat to my face. So kids say the darndest things, right? You can't expect that little kids are going to be out and that people are going to say stuff about them, which is why it's so important for anyone getting divorced that you are not talking about your ex or your soon to be ex anywhere yeah. in the vicinity of your children mm -hmm. where they can mm -hmm. hear it. It is don't do it. Mm -hmm. We all have our moments. I'm not going to lie, like, you know, stuff happens, but I, I believe that that happened. And I, I, I know that that kind of thing happens all the time. And the, the unfortunate part about it is that there aren't a lot of grandparent rights when it comes to divorce at all. I mean, I think it's interesting, the whole Markel act in terms yeah. of being able to give grandparents, you know, more time to be able to see, especially after the death of, of a parent, but grandparents, you know, can you imagine if your mom, for whatever reason, like wasn't able to see your kids anymore? Like, but, but balancing that with, you can't talk shit about me and then expect me that I'm going to be okay with having the kids with you unsupervised when you were creating parental alienation. It's, it's just a really fine line because it's literally, right. It's hearsay. I mean, it's your five-year-old saying something versus what, you know, your mother-in-law is saying. So it's tough, but I, I have had instances where I've myself been incensed about things that have come back and been said to me that were said uh, from the other side. Mm. Taylor Burton with a question. I'm going to toss this one to TH. This is uh, actually very relevant right now. So what are tangible ways to ensure the boy's protection from Wendy? So the grandmother is now in custody. The, the grandfather is 80 and a little bit out of it. And by the way, my mom thinks he's 100% involved. A lot of people think Wendy is involved. Uh, she could be charged at any time. So could Harvey. We just don't know. And Donna's, by the way, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. As you guys know, Phil had a knee replacement. He may or may not join, but Scott Duffy is going to be here tomorrow for Great Scott, your true crime Phil. Uh, that's going to be 12.30 p.m. tomorrow, 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to go into what's happening with the investigation uh, into Donna Adelson specifically, like what is going on behind the scenes. But they just seized her phone. So my point is there is a real possibility that Wendy could be in custody at some point. It could be soon. It could never happen. You just don't know. So the question, can professionals intervene, TH, at school, for example, to give them safety tips and safety contacts. And then she kind of continues it here uh, regarding the boys' protection. Ruth Markell, and she did do this on my show, asked that people in the community attempt to keep tabs on the boys. What are tangible ways to ensure their safety if Wendy endangers them? And I'll take it a step further. Or if something mm -hmm. happens to Wendy and she is taken into custody, what would happen? What could happen? So there should definitely be a protocol for guardianship for those boys. It's, it's as if someone passed away right? Who's going to take care of these kids? There needs to be a plan in place. I get a little bit nervous with everybody being a detective and a cop in town because things can get thrown out of proportion. I mean, you are still talking about two boys. If anything happens to these boys, they need to know who they can call in case of an emergency. Um, it does get a little bit dicey when Dyfus gets involved because then that just adds a whole other layer. And look, if they need to be called and it's justified, then so be it. But when you have so many cooks in the kitchen, oh, he looked really upset today, or, you know, he fell, someone must have pushed him. You know, people, people feed off of each other in a really negative way too. And if they're all against Wendy, and if, if Wendy is a good mom, to these boys, right? She's messed with everything else, clearly. But if she's a good mom and she's a source of stability, 
then you have to go with that. And the school can be on the lookout. I'm sure the school knows everything that's going on right now. The boys should also be comfortable talking to their teachers. Um, I know when I was going through the initial stages of my divorce, I am like, mobilization mom, like, what's the plan? Who's in charge? Who's helping out? And my oldest daughter had a teacher who she loves, and that was her primary teacher. So I told her because I knew that my daughter would be comfortable talking to her and she would check on my daughter. So I'm hoping that Wendy would take those steps anyway for her kids because of all of this trauma going on in their lives, regardless of her then losing custody of them and having to go to jail. Like there has to be a plan in place. In New Jersey, we have parent coordinators and this assumes there's a spouse, but there are people and programs and support for families out there. There are a lot of not-for-profits out there who can help families with support services, with guardianship plans. And so, you know, I kind of hope that Wendy is still keeping her boy's best interest at heart in terms of what's going to happen to them if something happens to me, even if it's not going to jail, if she gets sick or she gets hit by a car tomorrow, what is happening with those boys? Those need to be top priority. And honestly, for any of you out there who are thinking of divorce, getting a divorce, change your will, do your health proxy, make sure you have your shit in order because it's really, really important. We never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Clearly, look at look at the stuff that we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. And uh, you need to have that stuff documented and and really taken care of. TH is the voice of reason. Belinda Buckner, Joel, great best guest tonight. Shout out to Steve Cohen, otherwise known as Meve Moen. Uh, <laughs> these ladies rock. He made this happen tonight. Um, where can I get a financial cocoon? Friend of the show, Tiff Knox wants to know. I think I would enjoy that. Sounds like you'd be getting a massage or something. I wouldn't mind a financial cocoon. C-O-A. Me too. Yeah. I'm got, I can use a financial cocoon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> COE, step up the 15 hours a day that you claim to be working to like 23 and let's see what happens. Um, <laughs> Doghouse is going to be nice tonight. So I promise we would talk a little bit about Jared Bridegan and Shanna Gardner. That yeah. was also a really contentious divorce. It went on for seven years and she ended up moving to Connecticut. They moved to Connecticut at one point. She has an affair with a trainer. She ultimately divorces him. She marries this repairman from a gym. Uh, that's who uh, eventually, you know, apparently puts out a hit um, on uh, Jared Bridegan, this Microsoft executive. He had gotten remarried. He had two more kids. Uh, she claimed J- uh, Shanna Gardner, who comes from a very wealthy family. Uh, she claimed in the motion at the time Uh, And this is a quote, the husband is a stay at home father while being a full time student throughout the marriage, completing his Bachelor of Arts degree and is presently engaged in an online Master of Arts program. The wife, meaning Shanna, has provided the sole support to the family through regular and recurring gifts from her family to the parties, as well as from trust and or other family related funds. Olivia, I haven't been able to confirm this, but the family, Shanna Gardner's parents live in salt lake city they have a business they they're Mm -hmm. said to earn like 100 million in revenue a year so they're very Mm -hmm. wealthy um but again we're seeing almost a mirror image here uh that she's blaming the husband the divorce is contentious it went on for years they had children um how do you see this either the same or different as dan markell and wendy adelson well, I'd first like to know, I mean, if they have a hundred million in revenue, what's their actual profit and are they giving gifts or are they giving actual money from trust funds? Who is on the trust funds? Who's the beneficiaries? Who's actually the grantors? There's a lot that can go into having that amount of wealth and complexity. Um, and so how are they labeling the assets given? Because that is different than the other case. If they're actually doing it in the ways that you can trace And if they're presenting themselves in that way, it's all easily, um, you can find things very easily, but if you can just see it on paper, I'd like to know more of the financials of this a little bit more. Do you have any of that information of what are they giving? Um, um, It's having your custody battle. The only thing I know is that 
her parents were regularly regularly giving an eighty five hundred dollar a month stipend. That's that's pretty much all okay. I know. And then I know she takes off to Washington State, which is unclear yep. why she did that. And the parents bought her a million dollar home um, in Washington State. Uh, yeah. Obviously, it wasn't a big deal for them to do that. But beyond that, I don't really know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, curious. Th, just your thoughts on maybe the similarities and differences between Jared Bridegin and uh, Dan Markell and what happened to the two of them. I, I honestly, I watched that court TV coverage of it, and it really put me off. I mean, the first thing they said is that she comes from a wealthy family. Mm. So I'm thinking, oh, so what? Okay, great. She's got money. Great. She supported the family. Great. They have security and safety, and they can kind of. You know, they have they have a nest. I mean, they have a um, what am I, a, a net to fall on, right? A safety yeah. net. So I just I just felt like she was guilty from the very beginning of everything. Yeah, it's interesting. And I I was not to interrupt you. I'm sorry, but I just did. But um, I was just talking to an attorney, and we were talking about there's supposed to be a presumption of innocence in this country, but there really is kind of a presumption of guilt. Um, and a lot of that, terrible. I think. Yeah, I think I a lot of that has. That I'm not saying that she's innocent, but there no. is. Legally, I've heard lawyers say that it is tough because the connection here, Henry Tenen, who's the trigger man in this case, and he um, cut a deal. So he admitted to it. He was a tenant of right. the husband. Yeah, yeah. So that the connection is right. really between the husband, the new husband right. and the trigger man. Right. Right. So it could have been that, you know, maybe the ex-husband, Jared, was stressing her out, maybe you know, he was, thought he was helping her out by getting rid of the ex-husband. Who the hell knows? But but she was guilty in the first, like the whole time Court TV was covering it. She makes a lot of money. She hired a hit. He's a great dad. And the seven years in court, how many motions were filed? Who filed those motions? It could have been as much him as it was her. Why didn't they have a parent coordinator? Why didn't the court assign somebody to resolve this? Maybe there were other things going on. Maybe somebody wanted sole custody, which you're not going to get. It's 50-50. That's, that's the norm unless it's an extreme case. So I, there's just no mention of the other side. It's like he is a dream dad, and he may have been, but she's a bad person. She makes a lot of money, so she definitely is behind this. That's how it was presented. So I don't really see it the same way. From just from what I heard on that episode, I mean, it's not the same kind of information that they have in the other case, tracking the car, the cell phone, the tolls, the, the bus cameras, like there was nothing. There was a tire in the middle of the road that was placed there. He came out or whatever, and, and someone shot him. But it doesn't mean she set all that up. He had his kid in the car. Mm -hmm. I mean, in I don't know. I don't see similarities. CH, you got you got to get on Jose Bias's defense team. You got to get on that defense team for China <laughs> Gardner. Uh, Jessica, I, just, I don't understand. Right, and he didn't even get to look at all the evidence when I was watching it. So they were asking him for all the stuff. He's like, I didn't even get to look at it. So you know, your your problem is you got to get your information from STS, not Core TV. But I do love Core That's TV. That's right. I'm, I'm on there a lot. Like, I did not like Core TV's coverage of it. It wasn't right. It wasn't fair. Uh. Jessica, your your quick thoughts, and then we'll take a couple of more questions, and we'll we'll wrap this up. I mean, from everything that I'd read and looking at the case, it wasn't really clear to me what her motive would have been. He might have been annoying. He might have been a pain in her ass. But like you said, her family is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The financial greed certainly wasn't a motivation. It what didn't benefit her to get rid of him. It almost would have made more sense if somehow she'd been killed. And then how, somehow he would have benefited because, the, you know, there would have been money in a trust for the kids and he wouldn't have had to worry about their expenses and stuff. So I don't know that I'm 100 percent on the side of teach that I, I don't I don't know that I felt from other like coverage that I saw that I felt like she was all automatically presumed guilty. I mean, it's weird, the connection between tenant and her husband and that. that and by the way, just to be a little judgmental for a second, her relationship with that husband seemed bizarre to me anyway. Um, but I feel you're not like, the first one to say that. Yeah, but in the end, she I could totally have a lawyer that. and he couldn't. So then, yeah. and, and no, I know. But 
by the way, right. these are death penalty cases right now. Right, right. 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 Yeah. Crazy. So the fact that she was able to get Casey Anthony's lawyer, you know, the person, you know, the dream team equivalent lawyer and stuff. Yeah, I think that people, uh, you know, look at that as like, okay, well, what is she sort of trying to hide? But again, I, I feel like generally there's some kind of, you know, financial motivation behind these kind of things, or at least something that would make sense. It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me that she would have been a part of trying to get him killed. Like what would her point have been? Yeah. Mm. Uh, all great points. This is a very important question here. Um, I don't think we necessarily discussed it in this uh, vein yet. So from Catherine, what is your opinion of the impact of all this on Dan son? So I know for a fact, cause I know people that know the uh, of the Adelsons and, and go to the same synagogue down here. Um, they're very, very smart boys, which isn't surprising because Wendy's intelligent and Dan was super brilliant. Um, Olivia, starting with you, what do you think? Um, do, do kids, do they get, people have said that they're probably brainwashed at this point. Can kids be brainwashed like that? And do you, now they're 13 and 14, they're getting to the age that obviously, I mean, my kids are much younger, not much, but younger, and they're on, you know, the internet all the time and they know are these kids figuring out what's happening do you think and now grandma so, was taken away but go ahead yeah i mean i'm in the realm of financial psychology and i'm not a psychologist who can answer exactly what the detriment is doing to them throughout these horrific events i can only imagine that if we look at just the childhood the aces where if you have divorce even or if you've seen someone get in hit in your family, if you've seen death or had death so closely, those all pile up. And the more that you have, the more trauma that you really can't overcome as easily. So this is the biggest that you can possibly have. Um, so you have to assume that this is going to massively negative affect them. And just like Jessica was saying about just alienating one parent, the death of a parent and then having all of this publicity, I can't imagine just all four of the children in the one case and then in the other case, the two, I just, it's devastating uh, to see what's going to happen. Uh, by the way, I'm not T-Pain, one of our amazing mods, along with Gen X Granny. I see Space Coast. He does all the work behind the scenes. Um, Shaquille Oatmeal, the best name in YouTube, but I'm not T-Pain. My husband says, look at this. I have a podcast. Look, she knows I have a podcast. This is my mother FaceTiming me during a podcast. <laughs> I just told her. She I was just at my house for Hanukkah. She wants I'm to be on. on. I just told, you know what? Since it's my mother, I'm going to do She this. wants to Hold join on. us. Carm, I'm doing a podcast live. I'm Carm. doing a podcast live, so don't curse. <laughs> You're live on TV. <laughs> Call my wife. Call. I just told you I was podcasting. She said, so podcast and enjoy. She needs help. <laughs> Only in my family. I keep telling everyone it's not because of me, but I think this would be the greatest Super Bowl halftime show the world has ever seen. <laughs> I mean, imagine like Super Bowl 61. Everyone has seen Beyonce a thousand times. Has anyone ever seen their mother FaceTime them live during a show? No. Right, right, um, right. I am not T-Pain says, my husband says he gets Joel and Phil mixed up. He has no idea who Joel is or who Phil is. He just knows their names. Phil was a Marine. I worked at Carvel with Michael Littman. Um, Phil became an undercover narcotics cop. I was, for a year and a half, a Head Start teacher in new york city in a bad area phil became america's most respected detective i was running scripts at msnbc um <laughs> phil is getting a knee replacement i don't need there are a lot of differences i'm not t-pain tell your husband to get it straight um phil is slightly more tough than me i would say just a little bit so tell him he's the tough guy th to you um, this issue with the children, do you think they know what's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Are they finding out friends have to know, are they being bullied? Um, it, it's just such a tragic situation all around. What's the age difference between those boys? Th they're like Irish twins, 13 and okay. 14. Yeah. So hopefully 
they they are using each other for a source of strength and they have each other um, and they're relying on each other. But kids are aware of everything. They read body language. They understand the tone of your voice. They can feel it in the air. They um, are resilient. But how could they not? How could they not be damaged by this? Again, like Olivia said, you know, the loss of a parent, first of all, that's enough. And then you're the town gossip in not a good way. And your mom, too. I mean, everybody's talking about your family. And then hopefully it becomes old news, except that it keeps coming up in the news. So it's it can't be forgotten. It's just like, oh, it's you again. Oh, it's you again. So I hope that the school is giving them a safe space, that they're keeping eyes out for these boys. And hopefully these boys are really, you know, relying on one another and using each other as a source. But, you know, there's school therapists, there, there are guidance counselors in the school system. And hopefully, you know, and what I was saying about Wendy, you know, maybe she, hopefully she's doing what's in the best interest of her boys regardless of all the noise and all the horrific stuff going on around them. Uh, Jessica, I got completely derailed because of my mom's FaceTime. Did you respond to this particular uh, query? No, I haven't. And, it, and it, it, it does take me back to that story that I mentioned in the beginning of the family that I knew from Cherry Hill where the rabbi had been and killed. And even though the kids were, you know, older when that happened, I mean, I feel like these four kids, you know, his dance four kids, like they're going to need major therapy. There, there's just no getting around it. And do I think that they're being brainwashed? I do, even if it's inadvertent, which I don't know that it would be inadvertent on the Adelson side, but like, there's no way that they're getting some kind of a fair, balanced story of what happened. One of their parents died. Their grandparents are, you know, and, and uncle are in jail for it. And their mother might end up being arrested for it. Like, I don't know how you get a straight answer for that. They are being talked about. There are families that are, you know, around them who don't necessarily want their kids to socialize with them. I mean, it's there, there's going to be, they're a target, unfortunately. And, mm -hmm. and I know I was laughing earlier, but like, oh, it's so crazy that she changed their name back to Adelson versus keeping it Mark Markel. But like, they're going to go through life being pegged. It's almost like the Bernie Madoff stuff, like how the don't how the daughter-in-law changed their name so for to avoid the media attention. I believe there's some legitimacy to that. And I and I pray to God that that someone can help these kids so that they're they're able to, you know, work through whatever baggage is gonna follow them for decades to come. And I'll make that plea again on behalf of the Markells. And I know we've got a big following in South Florida. If people, you know, they literally don't know what's going on with their own grandchildren. So if you guys hear stuff, you can email me, surviving the survivor at gmail.com, surviving the survivor at gmail.com. Uh, going to wrap up in just a second. KCL is a friend of the show from Salt Lake City. She knows so much about the uh, Shanna Gardner, Jared Bridegan case. She says nobody else would have known Jared's schedule except for the widow and shanna exclamation mark nobody except for shanna would have had motive to murder jared except for shanna she was the only enemy that jared had so uh, mm -hmm. a lot of things uh in there by the way phil does not only does phil have, have a ferrari he has two ferraris <laughs> and i have zero ferraris uh so there you go uh this has been to a, a really awesome show uh with amazing guests here olivia brooke summerhill she's got the Summerhill firm, and uh, she's coming to us from the Northwest. She went through divorce herself. Olivia, your uh, your final thoughts this evening. Will you ever come back on this show? Number one, and number two, um, your advice to people who might find themselves in a similar situation to Dan Markell and Jared Bridegan. I would love to come back on the show, and I think my tip would just is whatever it may be and you're not alone if you're terrified of looking under the hood or if your head's in the sand and you don't want to look at the finances you're not alone you're among the very normal population but try to if you can look at this we've got cherry hill in the house jessica yeah um, it's not so it is the new landers yeah th there you go uh th and jess they're sitting side by side in two different places best friends 
They lived parallel lives. They got engaged a month apart. They got married a month apart. After 13 years, they found out their husbands were cheating and traveling with their girlfriends. They started divorce, etc. And ex expert, I believe it is. Um, yeah. TH, your final thoughts. Uh, you are definitely a voice of reason. What is your advice? What are your final thoughts on these two horrible cases we were discussing? When it all comes down to divorce, it it's really is about the kids. It's not to sacrifice your own well-being, but when you're the one going to jail and you're the one who's guilty, you just have to hope that there is someone looking out for these kids, whether it's the temple or the church or the community center or a teacher or a neighbor. So I really do, um, my heart is really with all of these kids who are without a parent and who are going through this kind of trauma. And I hope that this all comes to an end soon. Um, and as far as divorce is concerned, look, the process sucks. None of us got married because we wanted a divorce. None of us planned on divorce or we wouldn't have gotten married, right? But if you find yourself there, and we are not encouraging you to get a divorce, by the way, I want to be super clear about that. But there are 50% of marriages that end in it, another 25% that stay in your marriage because of fear for multiple reasons and you're unhappy. You have one life to live. Listen to all of these horrible stories that we've talked about tonight and how people's lives have been turned upside down. Be true to yourself. Trust your gut. Like Olivia said, it's not easy to look under the hood, but X Experts was created because knowledge is power. And the more you know and the more you learn, you'll be able to look under the hood and be like, okay, I need somebody like Olivia in my life. I need a TH and Jessica. I need somebody to help me find my way. And you have resources out there. Ours are free and we can definitely get you on your way and you will be okay. I promise. Very well said. Uh, Brianna also pointing out that Phil has not just two Ferraris. He also has a home in Hawaii. Uh, he spends half the year in Hawaii. I spent, I'm in Miami. I got, I got to say oh, it's pretty nice, God. but um, <laughs> Shannon, this is an interesting comment. I agree with this. Shannon married that guy uh the guy from the crossfit gym for the same reason charlie dated katie a lot of people do believe that that's the case that she could mm -hmm. manipulate him and uh have him do some things that she wanted to get done if you get the gist kcl coming back in here saying excellent guest tonight i could not agree more thank you belinda happy hanukkah to the waldman and markel family and everyone else celebrating out there and uh jessica loved having you on tonight I'll be Thank the judge you. says great conversation. Um, your final thoughts on all of this. I feel like honestly, Olivia and TH pretty much covered all of the things that I would say. I mean, divorce happens. It doesn't always end up in murder. You know, the stigma around divorce needs to go away. That's, you know, a, a lot of what TH and I talk about, but, um, I think having the conversations is one of the most important things. And to just know that like, you're not alone as, as both of these ladies said, and that we're all in it together. That's, that's what I think. I think so. If you want to have a laugh and you're getting divorced and you feel like you're going through hard times and you need a little pick me up, you our divorce, et cetera, podcast can do that for you, but it, it's, things will be okay. It sucks, but things will be okay. And uh, as Carm just told me the other day to uh, end on a very cheerful note, she says the span of time between 50 and 84, she says, goes by in a blink of an eye, and I too will be old and facing death soon. So let's all <laughs> keep that in mind. Stay upbeat. And um, I can't get rid of this comment, but look at this. Perspectives on trial life. Uh, COE, this is what we put up at the beginning, by the way. Perspectives on trial life. Uh, yours truly is going to be moderating Ruth Markell, the star of the show. Then you've got Dennis Murphy from Dateline NBC, Dave Ehrenberg, the Palm Beach, uh, state attorney out of Florida will be there. We're going to talk about exactly that perspectives on trial life. You can get tickets through Jaffco. I will post this cause I literally can't even read it on here. Uh, the print is too small, but Hey, what can you do? We'll see you there. If you're in town, please come to that. Until tomorrow, 12.30 p.m. Eastern. By the way, uh, we are doing a show. And then Monday and Tuesday, don't forget, Donna's arraignment is on Monday, taking it live with analysis. Show Monday night. Tuesday, Charlie sentencing, taking it live. Show on Tuesday night. Until then, 
Love you, America. Love you, Tallahassee. Love you, Jersey. Love you, New York City. Love you, Pacific Northwest. Love you, Israel. And love don't love the ambulance siren, and I don't miss that at all. Sorry. Next time. <laughs>